Welcome back to McMaster University course, Computer Science 1JC3, Introduction to Computational Thinking. I am Bill Farmer. We're going to start a new topic, Operating Systems and the Internet. I'd like to have you look at this movie poster. This is a poster for the film, The Imitation Game. And you can see here a picture of Benedict Cumberbatch. He's playing the role of Alan Turing. I consider this a very unique film because this is a Hollywood level film about a logician. The logician is Alan Turing. Here's a picture of him. We've talked about Alan Turing before, but he's a hugely important person in the history of computing. As I say here, he was a brilliant mathematician, logician, and computer scientist from the United Kingdom. He's most known for developing a model of computation based on the idea of a Turing machine. So this model of computation is relatively close to how computers work today compared to other models of computation that we've talked about like the lambda calculus and combinatorial logic. As you remember, he and Alonzo Church, roughly at the same time, showed for the first time that there are undecidable decision problems. And this began the outlining of the limits of computing. Now, during World War II, Turing spent his time working on breaking the code of the German Enigma machine. This was a machine that the Germans used widely to encode messages. Uh, this was hugely important work for helping the Allies win World War II, the Allies, uh, the British, the Americans, and the Soviets. The interesting thing is that the world didn't really know about this work by Alan Turing until the 1990s. Until that, it was considered top secret information and was concealed. So this was quite a surprise in the 1990s to find out that this famous logician actually was did something very significant during World War II. And after the war, he worked on designing and using some of the first electronic computers. He designed a computer called the Automatic Computing Engine, ACE. This was eventually built. He also got interested in artificial intelligence after World War II. And he developed an ingenious way of measuring intelligence of a machine, which is called now called the Turing test. Uh, the imitation game is an, another name for the Turing test. So the way this test works is very simple. You have, let's say, a machine that you think is intelligent, so you get a human, and you put the human with the machine hidden in some way, and then the tester, who's another human, can ask the machine questions and ask the human questions. The tester, of course, won't know who's answering the questions. Uh, so as far as the tester is concerned, they're asking A a question, then they ask B. But they don't know if A is the machine or if A is the human and vice versa. So if the human asks these questions, and some of them are answered by the machine, some are answered by the human, and the human cannot tell which of the two, A or B, is a machine, that is evidence that the machine is intelligent. That's what the Turing test is. Now finally, I want to mention that uh, there was never established a Nobel Prize for computing. But today there is a is a prize for computing called the Turing Award. This is considered equivalent to winning a Nobel Prize, and of course it is named after Alan Turing. Okay, so we're going to move on to... Oh wait, I almost forgot. I forgot to say something very important about Alan Turing. Notice that he was born in 1912 and died in 1954. 
you can see he lived for, to be 42. He died very young. Uh, the reason this he died so young is that it quite likely he committed suicide by eating a laced, an apple laced with cyanide. The reason this happened is that he was a homosexual and he was hounded by the British government because he was a homosexual who knew a lot of military secrets from his work with the German Enigma machine. He was convicted of being a homosexual and he was given the choice of chemical castration. So this is using female hormones to basically change him into change him away from being a man, or he could go to prison. He chose the chemical castration, but it's clear he had enough of this and he committed suicide. Now, the interesting thing is if you look at the Apple logo on an Apple computer, it shows the image of an apple with a bite taken out of it. I had always hoped that this was a tribute to how Alan Turing's life ended but Apple says there's no connection. Maybe, maybe there is. Okay, so let's move on to characters. So in computing, characters represent graphemes. Graphemes are units of a writing system. Of course, there are many kinds of writing systems. Each writing system has its own kind of the graphemes. Um, so, on computers, we need a way of writing things. We need writing systems. We need a way of representing characters. There are two main ways of doing this, ASCII and Unicode. ASCII is a very simple approach. Unicode is a more of a universal approach. You, you need to know about both approaches. So ASCII is a character scheme and it's based on the English alphabet. In particular, it's based on this, the symbols from the English alphabet on an old American typewriter. That's really what it's based on. There's 128 characters, 94 are printable. There's a space character and 33 non-printable characters. These non-printable characters are control characters. Characters that control how you, you do printing. And since there's 128 characters, we can represent them by either seven or eight bits. Now the non-printable characters are denoted by escape characters. So for instance, backslash N denotes the new line character. The new line character is an example of a control character, which is basically saying, start printing with a new line. So, so ASCII is a, is a very biased kind of way of of handling characters because it's basically just the characters of an English alphabet. It's not even suitable for closely related uh, writing schemes like German or French. So there's a different approach, a more, as I said, a more universal approach called Unicode. So Unicode is intended to represent the graphemes of basically any, any of the world's writing systems. And there are more than 130,000 characters now from 139 writing systems. And these characters are represented by either 8, 16, or 32 bits. So in everyday computer work, people usually use ASCII. But when they're doing something that is going to have interaction with the public, usually Unicode is used. Okay, now we're going to a really big subject, operating systems. So if you think about a computer, it's a piece of hardware. How does it run? What controls it? Well, what controls it is the operating system. It controls the computer. In a sense, a computer is just a piece of hardware that has a program running on it, and this program is the operating system. And the purpose of the operating system is to enable what are called application programs to be executed in the computer. So the operating system is a program, but it's a program to enable other programs to run on the computer. 
Now, there have been many operating systems written uh, in the past. If, you, if we go back 30 or 40 years ago, there are lots of operating systems. Today, most computers are using a very small number of operating systems. The, the most important examples are Microsoft Windows, Apple's Mac OS X, Linux, and Google's Android. It's important to note that Apple OS X and Linux are both based on Unix. They are really Unix style operating systems. There are many other Unix operating systems as well. So the operating, an operating system has two components. It has the kernel, which is the real heart of the operating system. And this is for controlling the computer's hardware. So an operating system is running and the kernel part controls the computer's hardware. And what it does that's very important, it provides services to application programs. These are services of the computer's hardware. We'll talk in a moment about what these services are. So on top of the kernel, we run application programs. And an operating system usually includes a rich set of systems programs. So these are programs that provide critical applications for the use of the computer. So if someone is writing a program to run on a computer, they don't have to start from scratch they can use these systems programs to do all kinds of important things. Now, the way the kernel works is it provides a set of what are called system calls. And these system calls allow application programs to access the computer's resources. Um, and of course, the kernel runs as an infinite loop. It's probably the best example of a program that's intended never to stop. It only stop, should only stop when you turn off your computer. Okay, so what are the kernel services? What services do the, does the kernel provide for other application programs? Here are the main services. It provides I.O. device management. So I.O. is input and output. It provides services for all the ways of getting input into the computer and getting output out. It also provides services for executing programs. Uh, today, almost all computers work by executing multiple programs simultaneously. The operating system is designed to handle that. It also handles memory management. So if we have a bunch of application programs running, they don't all get access to all memory. Memory is divided up. Different programs have access to only certain programs. Some parts of memory are off limits to app application programs. And similarly, there's file system management. There's the management of creating files, having access to files, deleting files, and so forth. So those are kernel services. Now, when a user is going to access an operating system or access any other kind of program, the user needs an interface. And there's two kinds of interfaces that we're going to talk about, two main kinds, graphical user interfaces and command line user interfaces. So we're going to start with graphical user interfaces. A graphical user interface, it enables the user to have access to the program via a graphical display. So this is normally a display on the screen of your program. Uh, let's say, out of your computer, so the screen of your phone, screen of your laptop, screen of a desktop, and so forth. And the display consists of a root window, which may be the whole screen, and various other windows and objects that are placed on the root window. So you're all familiar with these graphical user interfaces. The user interacts with the interface by initiating events using a mouse or a keyboard. So for instance, you can move your mouse to a certain point, click on it, that will cause an event. And the event that is, that is caused depends on where the input focus is. So the input focus is where the interface understands 
your focus is located. So be located on a particular window or a particular part of a window. So a GUI, a graphical user interface, handles these events as they occur. So it's basically, again, an infinite loop that's just waiting for events to happen. And when they happen, they get handled by the interface. Um, now, GUIs are, are interesting because they require a very large portion of the computer's resources. After all, they're handling all these graphics. And, then, and for that reason, they can be very complex, but they are relatively easy to use. Many, many graphical user interfaces can be used quite easily without ever reading any documentation about how they work. So the other important kind of interface is a command line interface. A command line interface enables a user to have access to a program via an interactive text-oriented program that runs inside a terminal window. So this is so this is a kind of program you start up what's called a terminal and then you start running the program and the user types things and then gets back responses. And for our operating systems, this program is called a shell. And for operating systems, you have multiple different kinds of shells. Uh, so there's things like uh, the C shell, bash, and so forth. Now, the way a shell is going to work, and it's basically the way a command line interface in general works, is the user types a command, the system reads it, the system executes that command, and then the system prints the results if there are any results for the user to see. So this could be as simple as working as a calculator. The user types two plus two, the system adds two plus two, gets four, and then prints four on the screen. So this kind of interface works as a read, execute, print loop, and it just executes one command after another. Now, the interesting thing is we can collect these commands up and package them into executable programs called shell scripts. And this is a can be very effective way to control a program or control the operating system. So um, command line interfaces use far fewer resources than GUIs. And they are much more powerful than GUIs. They have much greater flexibility than GUIs. Uh, GUIs are very good for novices. They're not good for experts. Command line interfaces are superb for experts. They're not very good for novices. The problem, the reason they're not good for novices, they're very hard to use. When you sit down to a command line interface, unless you've read some documentation or you have some experience, you have no idea what to, how to even start. You don't even know what the commands are. So they, they are much harder to use, but they are much more powerful. Okay, so we're going to stop here today. And next time, we're going to continue with 